Oslo's harborfront provides an inviting place to simply enjoy the urban scene between sightseeing stops. From here, a ferry shuttles visitors across the harbor to Bigdoy, a peninsula with several museums highlighting the nation's maritime history. The Viking Ship Museum shows off 9th century Viking ships, icons from those days of pillage and plunder. Norwegian marauders terrorized Europe for generations. Gazing up at the prow of one of these sleek vessels, you can imagine the horror peasants in France or England or Russia felt when those redheads on the rampage sailed up their river. Over a thousand years ago, three things drove Vikings on their far-flung raids. Hard economic times in their bleak homeland, the lure of prosperous and vulnerable communities to the south, and a mastery of the sea. In a boat like this, finely crafted of oak, the Vikings ranged far and wide. They settled over a thousand miles away in the west of France, which became Normandy, named for those Norsemen. And they hopscotched across the Atlantic, from Iceland to Greenland and on to the east coast of Canada, which they called Vinland. Imagine 30 men hauling on long oars, muscling through the sea for weeks and months on end. In 1892, a replica of this ship sailed to America in 44 days to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Columbus not discovering America. This ship, with its well-designed rudder and intricate carving, was probably a ceremonial pleasure craft for royalty to promenade on calm waters. Viking chieftains were buried in their ships with their possessions. In fact, that's why these particular ships survived. Excavations turned up artifacts of leather and finely carved wood, like these ornate sleighs. This horse cart is decorated with fanciful scenes from old Viking sagas. An adjacent museum houses another Norwegian ship, the Fram. A thousand years after the Vikings, the steam and sail-powered Fram took modern-day explorers Amundsen and Nansen deep into both polar regions. This tough ship ventured both farther north and south than any ship had gone before. Exhibits help you imagine life in these extremes, so far from the safety and comforts of civilization. For three years, this boat, especially designed to survive the pressure of a frozen sea, was locked in the grip of the Arctic ice. The Fram was well equipped with instruments for scientific research. State of the art in the early 1900s, these tools enabled the explorers to bring back important new data from the polar frontier. In this distant corner of Europe, many visitors find more high culture than they expect. Norway's National Gallery showcases the powerful beauty of this country's landscape and people as portrayed by its great painters. A thoughtful visit here gives those heading into the mountains and fjord country a chance to pack along a little better understanding of Norway's cultural soul. Landscapes have always played an important role in Norwegian art. This genre peaked in the late 19th century during the Romantic period, which stressed the power and beauty of nature. Stalheim by Johann Christian Dahl epitomizes the Norwegian closeness to nature. Romantics reveled in the power of the great outdoors. The rainbow says it all. This is God's work. Nature is big. God is great. Man is small. The birch tree, standing boldly front and center, is a standard symbol for the politically downtrodden Norwegian people, battered yet still standing. In the mid-19th century, Norwegians were awakening to their national identity. The bridal voyage shows the ultimate Norwegian scene. A wedding party with everyone decked out in their traditional dress, heading for the stave church, engulfed in the majesty of the fjords. Here and throughout Europe, nationalism and romanticism went hand in hand. These were hardworking, independent folk. People were poor, but they owned their own land. Paintings like these were patriotic tools. Edvard Munch is Norway's most famous and influential painter. In this 1895 self-portrait, we see a complex and troubled artist. 
Monk helped pioneer a new style, Expressionism, using lurid colors and bold lines to express inner turmoil and the angst of the modern world. The Scream is Monk's most iconic work. The figure seems isolated from the people on the bridge, locked up in himself, unable to stifle his scream. Monk wrote, this painting is the work of a madman. This expressionist masterpiece is a breakthrough painting showing angst personified. Monk suffered from depression. His father had a mental breakdown. His mother and his sister died of TB. When he eventually overcame his depression, he became a happier man, but he never again painted with such power. Copenhagen's new Carlsberg Glyptotek, named for Denmark's leading brewery, is one of Scandinavia's top art galleries. This is a great example of corporate money, in this case, all that beer money, put to good use. In about 1900, the family behind the Carlsberg Brewery donated its extensive collection of art and a fine building to house it to Copenhagen. Now, over a century later, the creative vision of that wealthy brewer still brings lots of people lots of joy. To lure garden-loving Danes, the museum sets sculpture among Mediterranean plants in its famous winter garden. The classical statues and lush trees transport visitors into a scene straight out of some exotic Roman myth. From this delightful hub, you can explore the museum's fortes, ancient Mediterranean art, and 19th and 20th century French and Danish art. The ancient collection is artfully lit and displayed. Each hall was designed for the art it would showcase, all done with that special Danish knack for design. A chorus of ancient Roman busts, thoughtfully placed at eye level, welcomes you into their world. And with this small but fine Egyptian collection, the power of the pharaoh reaches all the way to Denmark. The early 19th century was the Danish golden age when painters, writers, and Danes in general were celebrating the roots and values of their Danishness. Here, the leading Danish painter, Kopka, paints a scene at the ramparts of Copenhagen as if we were there with a romantic yet realistic flair. The museum's founder was both a friend and a major patron of the French artist Rodin, Europe's greatest sculptor since Michelangelo. Here, where sunlight is so plentiful in the summer and so rare in the winter, the light reveals the art in a loving way. Enjoying Rodin's famous kiss, you sense the artist himself would appreciate the play of the light. The word vike means shallow inlet. So Vikings are the people who lived along those inlets. Roskilde, strategically located along one such inlet, is home to Denmark's Viking Ship Museum. This museum is a hands-on center for people who want to experience Denmark's seafaring heritage. Traditional boat building techniques are demonstrated. And the museum's archaeological workshop employs the latest technology in conserving and better understanding remnants that survived from those fabled 10th century masters of the sea. The main hall displays five different Viking ships. These ships were deliberately sunk a thousand years ago to block the harbor entrance to the strategic and rich city of Roskilde. In 1962, they were raised from their salty grave. This was a 10th century ocean-going freighter. A ship like this likely carried Viking immigrants with their families and the entire farm to Iceland and later on to the New World. Leif Erikson made it all the way to America a thousand years ago in a little ship like this. Warships were skinnier and faster. This one was powered by 26 oarsmen. Fearsome boats like this terrorized much of Europe back when people dreaded those rampaging Norsemen. Stockholm's Nobel Prize Museum tells the story of the world's most prestigious award. Stockholm-born Alfred Nobel was a prolific inventor with over 300 patents. His most famous invention? Dynamite. Living in the late 1800s, Nobel was a man of his age. It was a time of great optimism, wild ideas, and grand projects. His dynamite enabled entire nations to blast their way into the modern age with canals, railroads, and tunnels. It made warfare much more destructive and it also made Alfred Nobel a very wealthy man. 
Wanting to leave a legacy that celebrated and supported people with great ideas, he left his fortune to fund the Nobel Prize. Each year, laureates are honored in the fields of physics, chemistry, medicine, literature, and perhaps most famously, in peacemaking. Portraits of all the prize winners since the first annual ceremony was held in 1901 hang from the ceiling, shuffling around the room like shirts at the dry cleaners. And video clips let you ponder the contributions of so many great minds. The Vasa Museum is my favorite maritime museum anywhere. It took several centuries, but Stockholm turned a titanic flop into one of Europe's great sightseeing attractions. The Vasa, while heralded as the ultimate warship of her day, sank just minutes into her maiden voyage. It was 1628. The king, eager to expand the reach of his domain, launched his formidable new warship. Laden with an extra row of cannon, she was top heavy. A couple hundred yards from the dock, a breeze caught the sails and blew it over. The Vasa sank to the bottom of Stockholm's harbor, where it sat for over 300 years. In 1961, with the help of steel cables and huge inflatable pontoons, the Vasa rose again from the deep. Today, the Vasa, the best preserved ship of its kind, is chemically petrified and housed in a state-of-the-art museum. The Vasa is decorated with hundreds of statues, all designed to show the power of the king, known as the Lion of the North, Gustavus Adolphus. Detailed models like these show life on board and evoke the instant when the hopes and aspirations of this mighty ship and her crew were dashed. Artifacts on display humanize naval life in the 17th century. This awe-inspiring ship is a time capsule from an era when Sweden was a European power and was gearing up to expand its empire.